Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May 22nd episode of Pub Talk Live, the live publishing talk show, airing the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author, a board member, and agent liaison for Pitch Wars, and a library event planner. Uh, you can subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking the link in the description so you don't miss an episode. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can find a link to the Patreon near the end of the video description down below as well. And then I also wanted to mention, because it's been out for about six weeks now, is my um, Corey's Qualms and Quirks podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letters and talk about their journey from first spark to day of publication. So I'm going to drop a link for that if you'd like to check that out. And now we're going to go ahead and bring on our guest co-host. Uh, Leah Hung is a graduate of Emily Carr University of Art and Design with a visual arts degree in painting and drawing. She has worked as an illustrator and graphic designer. Her lifelong love of drawing and storytelling led her to create her picture book debut, Happy Dreams Little Bunny. She lives with her family in Vancouver, British Columbia. So please welcome Leah. Hello. Hi. 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 I'm so glad you could join me today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Your um, picture book is so cute. The cover is, just, I don't know why, but I looked at it and it just felt like really relaxing to me. Oh, that's amazing. Thank <laughs> the, you. The color and everything, yeah. yeah. Um, Ebony says, hi, pubbers. Pubbers is what the viewers of my show um, call themselves, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. So uh, real quick, uh, the viewer poll for this week is, have you ever bought a book because of an author's social media presence? And that was inspired by today's uh, special guest. So if you haven't yet voted on that, I'm going to drop that link in the um, comments so you can go and vote on that before we talk about it at the end of the show. All right. We're ready to get in some news items. Our news is probably going to be a little bit shorter than it usually is because we have so many questions for our special guest. Uh, so just a heads up on that. And actually it was like a pretty slow news week. Like I wasn't finding as much as I usually find. Though the things that we have are big. <laughs> yeah, big. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll start. Uh, Netflix has announced officially that Millie Bobby Brown and Henry Cavill will return for an Enola Holmes sequel. As with the first film, Millie Bobby Brown will produce. So I'm really excited about that. I really enjoyed the first film. Did you see it? No, I didn't. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And then we announced um, a couple months ago on the show, the the books, they're going to be new Nola Holmes books as well. So we get all kinds of Nola Holmes stuff. But I did yeah. not know until I read this article that Millie Bobby Brown um, produced the first one. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, fascinating. So young. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was my first thought. <laughs> yeah. You have a big, big news item for us. I have a huge <laughs> one, yeah. So HarperCollins has officially completed their acquisition of the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Trade Division for $349 million. HarperCollins management has initiated a temporary organizational plan that will be in place until they can come up with a more permanent plan. And in other acquisition news, Penguin Random House's acquisition of Simon & Schuster has been approved in the UK, but is still under review in the US. So yeah. It'll, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how <laughs> this all shakes out. <laughs> it's like big, big changes going on. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> we're about to have a big four, I guess. Yeah. It's yeah. a big five. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, it's like a little terrifying <laughs> to see so much consolidation going on in the industry. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just like exactly. filled with anxiety. <laughs> like thinking about I know, thinking that. about it is, yeah, yeah, it's anxiety. Yeah. So. All right, let's go, let's go into some good news because I just, yeah. I can't handle this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know about anyone else, but my time load expo timeline exploded last week when it was announced that Peacock has ordered a new series adaptation of the Vampire Academy books by Rochelle Mead. The series will be co-written by Julie Pleck, who was the co-developer of the Vampire Diaries adaptation, along with its spinoffs, the originals and legacies. Um, and I, people... 
I mean, like, we're so excited. <laughs> uh, you know, all the people that kind of like came in the industry, I think around the mm -hmm. same time I did, um, when these books were huge, they're like super excited. I, there was a, a movie a while back, a couple of years ago, um, oh. but I don't think people really liked it. I never saw it, so I can't say, but. Yeah, I don't think I saw that either. Yeah. Um, but it seems exciting and to have someone who led, you know, the Vampire Diaries, which was obviously a very successful mm -hmm. adaptation. Uh, and I guess if you read the article, this is a good time to mention all the news items that we talk about um, after the show ends. I put the links in the description so you can check them out if you want to learn more about uh, any other things we're talking about. But in the article, uh, she basically signed a deal with Peacock and they asked her, you know, if she had her choice, like what one property would she like to do? And uh, she said the Vampire Academy, that was like her, what she really wanted to do. So, wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I think I have another big one, don't I? Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, I do. Got another big one. Um, so six months after announcing the start of negotiations, the Digital Public Library of America announced that it has signed an agreement with Amazon Publishing to make the ebooks and digital audiobooks they publish available to libraries. So libraries will need to use the DPLA Exchange, which delivers books to readers via the Simply E app in order to acquire these books. Well, that that's yeah. huge. <laughs> yeah, we talked about when they had had announced that they were doing um, negotiations. Uh, yeah, because a lot of people, I, I think a lot of people still don't know that the none of the books Amazon publishes themselves are available at libraries. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is huge, especially they have some like audio books that, you know, uh, are really popular and really cool sounding so but my library which is a large metro library system we don't use the simply e app so i wonder mm -hmm. if some libraries will start using it because of this deal yeah i wondered the same because i'm in canada and we we definitely don't use the simply e app we use mm -hmm. something called overdrive yeah we use overdrive oh, okay. and there are a couple different ones but overdrive is a big one Mm -hmm. The other one I don't like to use because the interface is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, but I listened to audiobooks. I just requested two audiobooks in Overdrive yesterday. <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> All right. So last piece of news. I promise you it'd be short. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in bookstore news, Skylight Books has voluntarily recognized the union formed by their employees. This is really good news to hear after a string of bookstores fighting employee unions over the past couple of years. Um, and I actually just read like right before we come on, not bookstore related, but um, a record store. Oh. Uh, their employees tried to unionize or started talking about unionizing and literally like two days later, they fired all of them and closed oh. the store. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so it's good to hear that Skylight, um, you know, voluntarily recognized the union. Um, yeah. And they're cooperating with them. And so that, that seems like hopefully more bookstores follow suit. Yeah. All right. So we're going to bring on our special guest. Um, Sienna Consul is currently Associate Director of Publicity at Little Brown Young Readers. She has worked in children's book publicity for over a decade with experience at Simon & Schuster and Harlequin Teen Inkyard Press. She has worked with number one New York Times bestselling authors like favorite at Pub Talk Live, Jason Reynolds, mm -hmm. and Ibram X. Kendi, Chris Colfer, and Holly Black, and award honored talent like Prince Award winner John Corey Whaley and Caldecott honoree Oge Mora, among others. So please welcome to the show, Sienna. Hi, everybody. It's so Hi. great to be here. Thank you for having me, Sarah, and always great to see you, Leah. Yeah. Hi, Sienna. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, so we got connected through your mom. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't yeah. know oh, Leah, you don't know this guy. I didn't know. Okay. A children's book author. Um, he is? Cerrone. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and I had posted I was looking for specifically a, a publicity or a marketing person to come on the show, and uh, she responded, and so she was like, oh, my daughter might do it, so it was <laughs> super cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm so glad it worked out, yeah. and uh, yeah. so great to get to do it with Leah, who is yes. one of my own authors that I worked yeah. with at Little Brown, so... Yeah, I was a, like a little um, stealthy about it. Like oh. Sienna, I asked, I asked Sienna who she wanted to be as her guest co-host, and she's like, I don't know, I can't think of anyone. So I just started looking at authors <laughs> that she worked with. <laughs> I couldn't choose. I was like, oh, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great authors out there. So <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad we got great. <laughs> we got it together. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna start. Um, us off with like a little bit of 101. Can you tell us what exactly a publicist at a large publisher does? And also we talked about this in the pre-show, um, how it differs from marketing. Sure. Yeah. I think this is a question that a lot of people have, like even once they get into publishing or once they publish a book, I think it can be hard to know the difference between marketing and publicity, um, or even just the, what a publicist does. So I know that for me, um, uh, a publicist role at a pretty big publishing house usually consists of like focusing on um, getting the book reviewed and getting the book covered in places. So pitching to media, pitching to newspapers, uh, book review journals, um, you know, big websites like BuzzFeed and Bustle, um, trying to, you know, depending on the level of celebrity of the author, pitching to like radio and TV. Um, and then there's also an element of event planning that goes into it. So, you know, in the before times, it was planning things like book tours and in bookstore events. Um, and then once things transitioned to the COVID world, it was a lot of virtual events and virtual book tours. And then there's also a, an element of it that's just being the point person other than editorial for an author. Like we we will liaise with the author and kind of route their questions to the right department. If it's not a publicity question, we'll sort of like forward it to marketing or forward it to sub rights or figure out who it is that's going to get us the answer and then relay that back to the author or put them in touch with the right department. So it's kind of a mix of all of that. And the difference between what we do as publicists and what marketers do is usually that in publicity, we don't have as big of a budget. Like we what we're working with, if anything, is just money to send an author on tour. And again, that really applies kind of like to the before COVID times. But <laughs> um, but marketers have a budget for like advertising, um, social media advertising or advertising with NPR or Entertainment Weekly. So they have, you know, more to work with and they use it in a very strategic way to come up with like ad campaigns and different promotions. And then marketing also handles like the social media accounts for um, a publishing imprint usually and figuring out, you know, cool stuff to do there to build buzz for the book. So we work in tandem with marketing, but we don't do the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, I do have to give Leah credit. She came up or she at least brought all these questions, almost all these questions to us. So even though I'm asking some of them, like Leah's responsible for the questions, I just want, like, I don't want anyone to think it was me. Um, but I do have a follow-up question. Um, what does a, a bare bones PR campaign for a book look like? Great question. And I also, I feel like I should clarify that the term bare bones, I feel like makes it sound like maybe not a lot <laughs> is going on for the yeah. book. But, but I will say that every book that that you take on as a publicist, you are putting a lot of effort into. And a lot of that effort is going into creating like a very targeted list of media to approach about the book and doing a mailing for that book. You know, like the FNGs or galleys, whatever advanced materials you might have for the book, we'll do a mailing like six months to seven months out from publication and then do a lot of email pitching or, you know, sometimes phone, but like a lot of times people want to be contacted only by email these days. Um, you know, so like reaching out to that targeted list of media that you created for the book. And then you do a finished book mailing closer to the on sale date and reaching out again. And, you know, there's lots of different moments like, you know, for a longer lead stuff like publications like magazines and newspapers that are harder to get reviewed in. That's the stuff that you're going to reach out really early on. And then some like online coverage you might get closer to um, on sale date. So it's it really is like a lot of just putting together a targeted list and thinking of which media is the right fit for the book and then really going after them and trying to start those conversations. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the targeted portion is really important as someone who gets a lot of pitches because I write for Book Riot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I get like, I, and there are several publicists who send me stuff where it's like, it's like you looked into my soul and you're like, what does Sarah want? And you sent me that, you know? Oh, uh, and then I'll have, <laughs> yeah, and then I'll have other publicists that just like send me the most random pitches. And I end up eventually usually just blocking them because, or not blocking them, but like, um, right. you know, send, sending it, yeah, sending it to, yeah. to the trash can because they're, like they've sent me 30 pitches and none of them are even remotely one, what book riot does and two things that I have indicated that I was interested in. There was one in particular who spelled my name wrong every time too, but, um, <laughs> oh, no, that's bad. <laughs> but yeah, the targeting is really important. And I yeah, think people it's a really overlook that to bring up just because it, it's part of what's hard about being a publicist, which is that you have to keep track in your head of like so many yeah. journalists and what mm -hmm. everybody likes and, and like you said, you don't want to pitch them something that they're not going to be interested in. You don't want to alienate them and you don't want to give the impression that you don't know their outlet because they will get annoyed and then they'll, <laughs> they'll block you or they'll delete your emails. And then you've lost that contact or you've kind of, you know, not preserved that relationship the way you wanted to. So, yeah. When I get an email, it's like, I want to send you this for a review at Book Riot. I know right away. I'm like, Book Riot doesn't do reviews at all, ever. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's safer to stick with coverage. Are you going to cover this book? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to learn a lot. <laughs> a lot of this I had no idea about. Yeah. This is awesome. <laughs> I'm glad. I, I hope yeah. it can be helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I was wondering, um, so, you know, I think. Um, PR campaigns vary, right? Depending on what the budget is, or um, so authors that have that don't have a lot of support from their publishers in terms of like a robust like marketing and publicity plan. Um, what what would you recommend that they focus on? Like, what would give them the most bang for their buck? Things that they can do on their own. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Great question. And again, I'll say that. Even if a plan doesn't look robust, um, mm -hmm. there is a lot going on behind the scenes that you don't always know about or that like can't be explained as well to you. So there are often a lot of things mm -hmm. going on behind the scenes for your book and you might not be aware. Um, but I will say that, you know, if if you're just starting out or if you feel like there's more that you want to do, I think really staying connected to the writer community is a big one. And I have to say, Leah, I've noticed that you're really good at this. <laughs> you tweet out a lot of yeah. like, things for your fellow authors and fellow picture book authors. And it's really wonderful because I think that's a huge way that authors like stay connected to their networks and, and really like build goodwill. And, you know, it, it helps to have that writing community because then you all yeah. can like blurb each other and you can post about each other's events and just help amplify each other, which is great. And also forging relationships with bookstores, um, which, okay. you know, sometimes, means a lot when an author approaches a bookstore directly just to say like, hey, I'm coming out with this new book and I've like really admired what what you all have done and some of your events and this and that. So if you have like a local bookstore that you don't already have a relationship with, like forging that relationship is really great because again, the bookstores, especially independent bookstores will do a lot to amplify you as well. And then they'll think of you for if they're doing some sort of panel style event or if they're doing an event about Bedtime books. I'm just gonna embarrass you a little bit, Leah, and just show <laughs> okay. your gorgeous book, wow. Happy Dreams, Little Bunny, <laughs> <laughs> which Sarah mentioned uh, yeah. covers very soothing. So is all of the artwork. Um, but you know, so that's the kind of thing you want to be. Mm -hmm. You want to be in people's minds. You want to be in other authors' minds as like someone they might want to do an event with. You want to be in bookstores' minds as an author that they would want to, you know, make an event for, or you know, just have you come in and sign stock mm -hmm. if it's a if it's a bookstore that's local to you. Um, and just having those relationships and really building them out will go a long way because, you know, it's a business of relationships. And maybe that's mm -hmm. not surprising that a publicist is saying that because our, <laughs> our role is very relationship focused, right. but it's true for authors as well. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, that kind of um, there. The, I think the other thing that I, I wonder about and <laughs> um, is that you kind of hear that social media doesn't move the needle all that much in terms of sales. And so I guess that kind of answers, that partly answers the question, you know, like, what, 
you know, why, why would you recommend that uh, an author have social media? But um, do you have like a, maybe a, like, can you talk about that? Yeah, a little bit? I definitely like, have yeah. thoughts on that. I mean, okay. well, it's also like, I feel like for so long, the conventional wisdom was that social media doesn't sell books until book talk. And then like book talk became a thing <laughs> and oh, now people right. are like all talking about it and how okay. certain things really move books that way. But book talk aside, TikTok for book people. Yeah. Um, I will say that what you just said is true. I think being on social media, even if like individual tweets or your Instagram posts don't necessarily move a ton of books right away. I think the sustained impact of being on social media and having mm -hmm. a social media presence over time, like eventually does lead to, okay. you know, better book sales. And I think it's because of the fact that, again, you can, you can post on social media about your events and you can get other people to post about it and, you know, have friends that you might start to forge friendships or connections with authors with an even bigger following than you, and then they might amplify you. So I do think there is, there's a long tail effect to it and there's a sustained impact that it has, mm -hmm. um, as well as providing community um, for authors who are you know, all over the world um, mm -hmm. and wouldn't necessarily get a chance to meet each other in person. So I think there's there's a lot of value to it. And I think in publishing, it's, it's really hard to assign like a direct correlation or connection sometimes to like what has caused a book to really break out or sell a bunch of copies. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not an exact science all the time. So it it kind of just benefits you to like be on social media for all those other reasons instead. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I can see. Yeah. Totally you know, makes which sense. is hard for some people because some some authors yeah. are like introverts and not really that into social media. So I get it. I get that it can yeah. be a challenge. But I think the more you do it and the more you have like friends that you can sort of copy, like fake it till you make it at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, the easier it gets. Yeah. So yeah, I've then, been, oh, oh sorry. Leah. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, I was just saying. So I have a podcast, Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, that I mentioned at the beginning, and one of the questions I asked them is how they learned about publishing. And so, so many authors have mentioned Twitter, especially, and like learning about querying and and publishing and how it works and that kind of stuff. And and several of them have mentioned it in terms of networking too, like with other authors. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that can. It can be an advantage. I think the problem is people think they're going, they're going to go on Twitter and they're going to tweet about their book and they're going right. to get book sales. And that's not, that's just not the, even if Twitter works for you for publicity, that's not how it happens. <laughs> yeah. Like if anything, I feel like it's more effective for like getting people to show up at a book event, um, you know, or just yeah. getting, if you get like a great media hit, like Leah, you were in Entertainment Weekly for Happy oh, Dreams. Right, yeah. <laughs> so that's like yeah. a nice place to like brag about it. Like I hate the <laughs> brag because yeah, I feel yeah. like it's such a negative connotation, but really, you know, self-promotion is a good thing. And like, no one's going to toot your horn if you don't toot it yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I'm always an advocate of yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's one of the things that it feels strange doing yourself. But uh, when I read other people, you, I'm always, you know, I'm always really happy to read about other people's good news. So mm -hmm. I think, I think reading, reading tweets like that, or it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The more you read them and get a feel for the language that people yeah. use, the mm -hmm. more easily it comes when it's your time to do it. So, yeah. so when it comes to you doing your job, what can your authors that work with you do to make your life easier? Oh, that is such a nice question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, honestly, it's so many of the authors that I work with are so great and like don't don't even need to be told this. But um, I feel like communicating regularly and honestly with your publicist is a good thing about like what what your comfort level is with things and what you're willing to do. Like if you if you have a really demanding day job and you don't have time to do like guest posts for blogs or, you know, other content creation or something like that, then like be honest about that so that your publicist can come up with an alternate plan and like figure out what it is that what the pitch angles are and, and how they can best use you. But like if you do have time and you love creating content, that's something you're gonna to wanna to let your publicist know right up front because then they can pitch you for things like, oh, like 
you know, they'll write this blog post for this, for We Need Diverse Books or something like that. And they can pitch you for things like that. Or, you know, if for some reason, if your project touches on a social issue and you think you could write a really great op-ed about it, that's something that you'd want to talk about with your publicist and kind of brainstorm. And then, you know, he or she could, or they could pitch it to, you know, Time Magazine or, you know, Washington Post or one of those other outlets that might want to publish like a serious op-ed about an issue of the day. But you just have to be honest about your bandwidth and like what what you're willing to do. <laughs> hmm. um, so what's the what's the number one tip you would give an author then? Ooh, the number one tip. Yeah, number, number or so, two or three. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure people would want to know more than uh, one. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I mean I guess the number one tip I would give is again to like think of think of publishing your book as a as a long game and to like not yeah. be too discouraged if like the first week it doesn't sell like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies, you know, because it is it is like a long game that you're playing, you know, like you're you're publishing the book and you're building a career and hopefully getting, you know, the next book and the next book published and again, building your social following, building your relationships with bookstores, um, with other authors. And it's the kind of thing that it'll only grow over time. So if it's not something that, you know, hits a bestseller list right out the gate or something, it doesn't mean it's over, <laughs> like, you know, and there's, there's always, you know, a long tail effect. And there are lots of bookstores working really hard to sell your book as a backlist title. So there's a lot of reasons to just continue sort of plugging away, even if you maybe didn't meet the goal that you hoped you would meet, um, like right at on sale week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I'm gonna look through the questions that we have. Okay. Um, can you tell us about like one of your biggest gets, like something that you're really excited to get one of your authors, an opportunity that you're yeah. able to get your authors that you're really excited about. Yeah, thanks. I mean, this is a fun question. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's tough to decide because I feel like, okay, so I did get NPR weekend edition um, for one of my authors, um, for my illustrator, actually Michaela Goad, uh, oh, for her first book, Encounter. And then as you as you all know, Michaela Goad won the Caldecott for We Are Water Protectors this year. But her another book of hers with us, who's the author is Tasha Spillett Sumner, I Sang You Down From the Stars. Um, I got NPR weekend edition for Michaela for that. So that was really lovely because they do a great job with their interviews and you know, the NPR audience is dedicated book buyers. Um, so that I was really proud of. And again, like they do such a good job with the interview. Like sometimes you'll book an interview and the producer <laughs> or whoever's like running things will ask a bunch of questions not related to the book or like not focus yeah. on the book as much as you want them to. But NPR just always, especially weekend edition, just really focuses in on the story and the artwork and they ask, ask such insightful, lovely questions. So, that was a really fun one um, to be able to listen to and and book. So yeah, yeah. always chasing after NPR. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually listened to that one. It was great. And, oh, thank you, Leah. Yeah, and Michaela oh, is she's fantastic. Like, she's really great. Yeah, I'm very. And you know, just it was really exciting to be able to book that for an indigenous um, creator as well, and for yeah. such an underrepresented community. Um, it's really nice to see that media are sort of waking up to that and like covering much more diverse populations now. Yes. Um, what is media interested in mostly these days or? Yeah. Does that, that, does that make sense? <laughs> I was thinking, I was gonna add to that then I thought, no, that's not that, no, it's like, it out. <laughs> I feel like we're, we're all kind of wondering. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, and it probably changes all the time, right? <laughs> no, but I mean, there is sort of an answer to this though. Okay. Um, I mean, I feel like most media, they're looking for things that tie into real world events, right? Like newsworthiness. So a lot of times like nonfiction gets covered in the media like more frequently than fiction, just because that's that's the news angle, that's the hook of like, okay, what, what real world event does this tie into? Um, you know, coming up soon, it's gonna be the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. So there's going to be a lot of coverage of books that deal with race, books that deal with anti-racism. Um, 
you know, things that touch on that kind of topic. If you really follow the news cycle, you see that the books that tend to get covered are books that somehow relate to that. Um, but that's that's more in the like TV and radio space, I would say, and also some of the big newspapers like New York Times and Washington Post. But you also see there's a whole other subset of media like parenting media, like the website Romper and Parents Magazine that are always kind of looking for things like social emotional literacy, um, bedtime books like yours, Leah. And, um, you know, I have another author, Todd Parr, whose books um, like the feelings book and the family book get a lot of coverage like over and over just because those are topics that parenting media and educators and people who work with children always care about. So it's kind of, it's both those answers. It's like, what's newsworthy and then what's really relevant, especially in kids books to like what all those gatekeepers and parents and teachers want to be talking about. Mm -hmm. So. I'm going to pivot back to social media for a little bit. You specifically mentioned TikTok. I technically have a TikTok account, but like, <laughs> the one should go look at it right now. Oh, you know? okay. um, do authors need to be on TikTok? I think if an author wants to be on TikTok and they they like making videos, they they should be on it and that's great. But I don't think authors need to be on TikTok, especially because a lot of the content creation that's out there that um, amplifies books is really not involving the author directly. Like a lot of it is, first of all, it's a lot of YA. It's a lot of young adult focused content. Like so far we haven't necessarily seen a ton of like picture book and middle grade things going viral on TikTok, but a lot of young adult stuff does. and it's just, it's very fan generated. So it's like readers making videos about how much they love a certain love interest or like how a book really made them cry or made them angry and they threw it across the room. There's like a lot of like very heightened emotions <laughs> on book tag. Um, but they don't tag the author and they don't involve the author in the video at all. So it's kind of like, I don't think an author needs to be on TikTok unless they want to and they want to see all of that stuff. But fans really generate the content and they like they get the views because they show a lot of, like I said, heightened emotion in the videos or they like know how to stage a video and like make it really pretty. And so that's kind of what's, you know, been the cause of certain books taking off on book talk, not, not the authors doing something that then went viral. Okay. All right. So, so my, my not, three, you, three you TikTok videos, <laughs> you just stay there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's kind of a relief. <laughs> but I will say it is kind of fun. Like I'm on it now and kind of yeah. like Sarah, like I, I don't know if anyone should go look at my profile. I got really inspired and made like a few videos when I first started. <laughs> but it's just fun to be on it to explore and like to yeah. see the other videos and accounts that are out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a that was like one of my yeah, I really, yeah, I was really interested to know what you'd say about TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hope that's a big relief for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I'm more, yeah, I'm more are, introverted and that just, yeah. ugh, that just makes me, <laughs> that makes me nervous. <laughs> well, and I feel for you guys too, because yeah. it's like every, every few months, it seems like there's some new oh, thing or new true. social media mm -hmm. platform yeah. or trend that everyone for a little while is saying like, you need to do this, you need to be on this in order to, sell books or like get attention. And it's not really always true. <laughs> like it's, it's more nuanced than that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I don't, I don't remember. I was just like listening to you. <laughs> um, I did want to ask you, this is not on our list. I'm just like going completely off script now. Um, obviously I like podcasts a lot. Uh, do you, do you book clients for a podcast? I, I hear a lot of nonfiction authors on podcasts, but usually not a lot of fiction authors. How, what has your experience been like with that? Yeah. I mean, we do definitely try to pitch podcasts often. That's like a, a part of our, one of our categories of media that we do a lot of research on and try to pitch to. Um, it can be, it can be tough. You know, a lot of podcasts don't necessarily have dedicated like space in their episodes to talk about books mm -hmm. or interview authors, but like every once in a while, like you'll get lucky and you'll get one. Um, like I, I had pitched Roxanne Gay's podcast, Here to Slay, for mm -hmm. Jason Reynolds. Um, it was really for Jason and a couple of other authors as well. 
but Jason was who they picked. <laughs> um, mm. And so they ended up interviewing him. And that was. I mean, like, I don't blame them. I would pick Jason too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's wonderful. He's, he's phenomenal. Great. <laughs> yeah. He's just an angel walking on earth. Um, so, and, and, you know, just really great to listen to. So that was really fun. That was a, a fun get for me. But again, it can be, it can be tough sometimes to know what podcast producers are looking for. Um, but there are certain like parenting podcasts that, mm. you know, we've done research on that, we try to find like, I think there's one called um, One Bad Mother that is like Maximum Fun is the production company. And, like, <laughs> they're really fun. And so I've, you know, talked to their producer a couple of times. So it's just things like that, like looking for looking for the podcasts that actually do cover books or want to cover books. Um, because like you said, there's there tends to be more of a leaning toward nonfiction than mm -hmm. fiction. But sometimes uh, you get lucky and, and there is a producer that wants to cover fiction or kid lit on their episode and then you go ahead and book it. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, do you, can you share some of the projects you're working on now? Sure, yeah. uh, let's see. Um, well, I did okay. have, I did just recently, the book, speaking of Jason Reynolds, Stamped wow. for Kids came out by mm. Jason Ibermex Kendi and Sonia Cherry Paul with illustrations by Rochelle Baker. Let me see if I can find a good one. Um, that one, this one is a ton of fun. This is an oh, adaptation yeah. of Stamped that is discusses racism and anti-racism for the younger set. It's more of a chapter book format, so ages six to 10 years old can read it. Um, so we're really happy to have that out in the world. Again, there's just so much, there's so much in the news and there's so much that goes on and kids are aware of it, you know, it's in their periphery, they're, they're experiencing it, and they don't mm -hmm. always have the language to talk about it or process it. So a book like this, I feel like is going to be really, really critical for a lot of kids to work through some of those issues. And again, just, you know, bring, bring a different mindset into the future. Like these are the kids that are going to grow up and have a chance to change it all, you know, like, like, we're mm -hmm. all actively growing and changing too. But for kids that young to read something like that, and then just for for more of their life they have the tools and they have the language to talk about this kind of thing um i think is a really beautiful thing so we're really proud of that one i'm really happy to be working on that um and then i'm also working on the sequel to carrie maniscalco's book kingdom of the wicked it's called kingdom of the cursed it comes out in october speaking of book talk that is one that like book talk really loves um and i have like a personal love for it because it's about um Sicilian witches. It's about these twin sisters wow. um, who are witches in 19th century Sicily. And I'm Sicilian. My ancestors are Sicilian. So that was kind of fun to get to work on a book that took place in Italy like that. And I also am working on the next book in Chris Colfer's series, The Tale of Magic series. It's called The Tale of Sorcery. And it comes out at the end of September. And it follows Bristol Evergreen and her fellow fairies um, and beings with magical powers um, as they sort of try to navigate the various challenges of <laughs> living in um, the world that they live in. So those those are really popular with kids and yeah. Chris is great. So excited to keep that series going. Oh, that sounds great. Um, and those are a little ways out. So how long do you typically work with an author then? They are, yeah. yeah. We we actually just got our assignments for books that are coming out starting next year, like in March oh. and April of 2022. So okay. we do start to get our assignments and get our, you know, start getting plans ready for a book like almost a year out. Um, wow. And then, okay. Yeah, because and because our timeline is sort of that we want to be able to like about nine months before on sale date for a book that's when the title and the cover might start like feeding out to retailers like amazon.com barnesandnoble.com target you know wherever and as soon as that's out there like we want to be able to react to it and like see if you know people are pre-ordering it see ways of building buzz for a book amplifying it um getting it on lists like sarah mentioned book riot book riot has great lists of upcoming books or books to pre-order so does buzzfeed um, and there are lots of different outlets that kind of can start the buzz early for a book. And so we want to be in a position to make that as, as strong as possible once that book starts feeding out to retailers. So it's, it's good to know at least a year in advance what you're going to be working on. Mm 
And how many authors do you work with at one time then? Or oh, it's probably a lot. Really right? Good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, I feel like I should just sit down and count one day because I always yeah, yeah. <laughs> get this question. And they're all in different stages, right? Yeah, of, uh, they yeah. are. <laughs> I mean, publishing is such a weird, I'm sure there are other industries that this happens in, but you know, like when you're working on, you're working on books that have already published and you're trying to draw attention to the backlist that's already published, but then mm -hmm. you're also working on things that are coming out in just a few weeks. And then you're getting your assignments for things like a year later. So you're really always in like, the past, present, and future yeah. <laughs> when you're yeah. working on your yeah. books. So I would say, I mean, at any given time, I feel like there's probably like 30 to 40 authors that like will be coming in and out of my inbox, like asking questions or that I'll be emailing to try and get their attention about something um, and trying to strategize with them about what to do over the next few months. So, um, but you know, like any author that I've worked with over the, past few years, it's like, they're always in, they're always like on my radar and like in the back of my mind, even if I'm not actively working on a campaign for their book, because mm -hmm. I want to be able to, if I get a Google alert for their name and see that they got covered in something, I want to be able to tell them that and add that to their media summary. And, you know, if there's, if there's a reason, like, again, if something newsworthy happens and it relates to a book that's been out for a couple of years, I want to be able mm -hmm. to still tell that author and like, see if we can get it some renewed media attention. So there's always, there's always a reason to kind of like be thinking of all my authors, even the ones that I'm not actively working on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment, a question from the comments. I'm going to ask you, Sure. Anitra asked, do you share with your authors how pre-orders are going? <laughs> that is a good question. And actually as a publicist, I don't even always have those numbers myself. It's usually sales and marketing that keep track of those numbers. Um, but you know, you don't always have, as an author, you don't always have direct contact with the sales and marketing staff. So it's usually a question that goes through your editor. Like if you want to ask your editor about that, then your editor will go to sales and marketing and try to get a summary for you. And then I think usually they will share, like the editor will share it with you. But it's mm -hmm. not usually something that, it's not a conversation that usually happens between an author and their publicist. So. Yeah. All right. I'm interested. So my day job is in, as an event planner for a library. Mm -hmm. And so I deal with a lot of publicists in that realm as well. Um, and we work with a bookstore too, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and on the publicists often want to know how book sales went at the events, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Sorry for annoying about that. <laughs> like we no, usually email I mean, like right after the event. Like how many books did we sell? <laughs> yeah, luckily I can just uh, put that on the bookstore. So that's fine. Um, <laughs> but I was interested in what you've seen in trends of, you know, in-person book events sales versus the virtual events that we've been having for the past year or so. Yeah. Have, have the virtual events been selling books like the in-person events do or... How's that been going? I feel like what I've heard from booksellers themselves is that the sales are not quite there with what the in-person mm -hmm. events were, which is one reason that a lot of bookstores were really eager to get back to having in-person events. Um, but I think there are some exceptions, you know, like it just depends. Like I think, I think some events have had a surprising number of, you know, almost corresponding book sales to like how, how many, like, you know, an author who had a book two that was, that released during the pandemic, but book one came out before the pandemic, like had comparable attendance at their virtual events and, and pretty good sales. Um, and then there's also the element of like being able to, if it's a bookstore that's willing to ship internationally, like they can have an event that international customers can come to and then they can sell some books that way that they wouldn't have been able to with an in-person event. But I do think generally what I've heard from booksellers is that the sales are better with in-person events. And so they're eager to get back to that. But I wouldn't say that's a reason not to do virtual events. It's just probably a good idea to like temper your expectations a little bit mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. um, do you see in-person events happening kind of in the in this later part of the year? Do you think? Um, you know, I think in some places, yes. Um, oh, okay. I, I think probably like toward the end of the year, like in the fall, maybe like October through December, we'll see some in-person events mm -hmm. by region, like different regions that are more comfortable with it. But I think the majority of bookstores are probably gonna wait until 2022 to do like 
a bunch more in yeah. person mm -hmm. events. I think it'll probably be very select, like again, maybe for, you know, celebrities that they think are gonna draw a really big crowd or, you know, or if it's a local author that like wants to have a local launch event, you know, they'll probably have them do that. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think it will be as frequent as it was before COVID, um, at least not this year. But I think in right. 2022, we're gonna start to see that rhythm pick up and be more like it was before. Do you yeah. feel like there might be a hybrid then in the future? Like, do you, have you found- um, I do think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, finish your question, I feel like- Oh <laughs> yeah, no, just um, like even post COVID in 2022, do you like there, I guess, I mean, the reach of virtual events is, it can be worldwide, right? So there is yeah. some benefit in that yeah. sense for, you know, exposure wise or there is a benefit. wise, right? And there's also a benefit so. for authors who, you know, don't have a travel budget, right? Like if, yes. if an author is not gonna be sent on the road by their publisher, but they can do virtual events that appeal to, again, people from anywhere. So, you know, you could mm -hmm. do like a, an East Coast event, a Midwest event and a West Coast event and like reach all of these different people because those bookstores have their own audiences on social media that they're marketing to and you can reach a lot of people that way. So I do think that, I do think it's gonna be a bit of a hybrid. I think there are gonna be in-person events and then there are gonna be virtual events and bookstores are just gonna have people dedicated with like different strategies for each type of event. Yeah. And I do think there'll be like a combination of both because like you said, you can, it could be worldwide. You could get yeah. international customers buying, mm -hmm. you know, the U.S. editions of books, which is like great, like we love that. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't we want that? Yeah. So you know, I, I think there's benefits to to doing both. Um, yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about doing hybrid events where the event itself is both in person and broadcast. Oh, that's and but from like an event planner perspective, especially yeah. when it, an event planner who doesn't have an AV team. Um, that's, yeah. it's very, it's much more complicated than I think people think it is to yeah, get, like, I was mildly quality, terrified when you first yeah. that. I was like, to oh. get like quality <laughs> audio. If you don't have, you know, a full, like the larger yeah. events, like for example, RT, um, it, which isn't around anymore, but they had a full AV team. Um, so they were able to like record those good audio and everything. But just like, if you're talking about small bookstores and libraries, they just don't have the resources to do quality hybrid events. So one of the experiences is going to have to suffer, mm. you know? Yeah, um, I also think it makes it, there's like an inequality of like the viewing experience, you know, yeah. like the people that are in yeah. person are getting one type of experience and then the people at home, like viewing while it's going on virtually, like don't, they don't have the same presence um, and mm -hmm. it, might not be as easy for them to ask a question or get noticed by the author or whatever. So I don't know. I think for that reason and for the reason you just specified, like the, you know, certain facilities and certain venues just don't have the capability to do that. I think, I don't know if it's the greatest idea. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I was on a writing conference that was in person, but it was also being broadcast. And we were, when I say we, I mean, I was like on a panel we were like constantly interrupted and having to wait for the online version for something, you know, something wasn't working with the online version. So we were delayed. And so, yeah, it was just really awkward. And that was a place that had the resources, like the AV resources too. Yeah. So, the whole idea yeah. of it makes me nervous. <laughs> I do understand the book sales bit though, because yeah. part of, part of buying a book at a book event is getting that like, one minute, two minutes to chat with the author. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's not something that people have been able to quite replicate the same feeling. Like I've seen some do virtual signings where you get to chat, you still get to chat with the author, but mm -hmm. it just doesn't quite feel the same, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I The only event that like, well, there were a few virtual events that I worked on that were tried to approximate that. And like one of them was um, for Lainey Taylor, like she had some mm. new issues with these beautiful covers of the Daughter of Smoke and Bone books yeah. come out. And I did a few events with her where there were like, there was like a VIP portion afterward where mm. fans could, like fans who purchased the book could take a few moments with her. Like, and it was, we used in like some 
Zoom sessions, we used breakout rooms and others, we mm -hmm. used some other technique, but it did allow for people to have like some private like time with her and like a real conversation. And so those, I mean, the attendance for those was actually really high. Like I, I do kind of think the VIP element helped mm -hmm. um, to sweeten the deal for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But again, even, even with that, it's like, the like those were book plates and a lot of people would prefer to have their book directly signed and that's just like yeah. not feasible for so many yeah. authors with virtual <laughs> events so it's there is there are certain things that are just like hard to replicate and i think people like you said the experience that they're looking for from an in-person event they're not quite getting it from yeah the virtual world though like i will say i've seen so many authors speak that i would never probably would have been able to see because they never come to florida <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I grew up in Florida, so I yeah. don't know. <laughs> I know yeah, that. authors never come to Florida. Um, but uh, we did down also, there, it's a big state. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, if you're going, you you better be planning on hitting more than just. If they go into Florida, Florida they'll, yeah. they fly into Miami and fly out of Miami. So like <laughs> the rest of the state, whatever. Um, we did have one event, one virtual event with Frederick Bachman for ordinary people that apparently the seals are really good for that and i really understand that though because i you know i wasn't really i'm not really interested in the genre that he writes um but he was so good like he was so funny and so clever and he had such great answers and that afterwards i was like yeah i want to read his books <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. so well, that's yeah the other part of it too right is that like some people have a presence that like transcends and like can even be really engaging on zoom like and on a virtual mm -hmm. event and that's i think that can be the difference between whether an event ends up selling a bunch of books or not <laughs> like yeah so. all right so um let's talk a little bit about you for a second uh how did you get your start in publishing uh you know and how has your career kind of progressed over the time over time Thanks for asking. Uh, well, you did mention um, earlier that my mom, Dorian Cerrone, is a children's book author. Um, and she she has a middle grade book called The First Last Day that came out from Simon & Schuster's Aladdin imprint a few years ago. And her debut novel was a young adult called Dancing in Red Shoes Will Kill You. Now I'm just like shamelessly promoting my mom. <laughs> but, but she is the reason that um, <clears throat> that I knew that there was more to book publishing than just editors. Um, you know, like I didn't know what there was. I just knew that there were <laughs> other, there was like a bigger machine um, behind all of it, like making those books come out. And so when I first graduated college, I, you know, she was very supportive of me moving to New York to look for a job. And luckily, like pretty quickly, I got something at Holiday House. Um, although it, when I worked at Holiday House, it looked very different than it looks now. It was, it was much, um, smaller and it was like all on one floor of a building oh, wow. <laughs> but like maybe like 13 people working in the office um and I was basically just like an administrative assistant there but it was a good first office job and and it was kids books so it was a, a foot in the door and I kept working there for a little while and then I did an internship with um open road integrated media which was at the time like focusing on ebooks and creating enhanced ebook content and then after that, I got my start as a publicity assistant at Simon & Schuster Children's Books. And again, I wasn't like 100% sure what publicity was or that I wanted to do it, but it was it was a way to start and learn something. And then it worked out really well. And it turned out like, you know, to be a good fit for me because I'm an extrovert and I love talking about mm -hmm. books and I love getting people excited about books. So really starting at Simon & Schuster as a publicity assistant was when my career like really kind of started um <laughs> and so then i just kind of continued to work my way up there and was ready for a change and came over to harlequin teen for a while and worked only on young adult books and then i missed working on the other wide range of picture books and middle grade and stuff for younger kids so found my way back to little brown books for young readers and the rest is history yeah <laughs> all right so um, we are almost out of time, but I have one more question that I ask every guest who comes on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually I give them a little bit of heads up, but I forgot, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I tend to go on, I talk a lot, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, no, I mean like before we start, uh, but anyway, what is the most important book you've ever read and why with you defining important however you would like? 
Wow. Oh, that's a tough that's one. That's why I like to give a heads up. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> that question is like so much pressure. But <laughs> I think I I would have to choose. I mean, this is also like one of my favorite books, but The Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett to me is one of the most important books. And it's because I define important as like something that gives you hope and something that um, makes like something that drives home the power of storytelling. And I think that book really does that. Um, and really kind of like the whole point of it is that she and, you know, other people in the book are going through really hard times and the stories are what get them through. So to me that, that makes it the most important book. Nice. Good answer. All right, Sienna, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about publicity for like 45 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you. I, I hope the answers were helpful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they were so. amazing. Yeah. Great thank to see you. you both. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, so great to see you. Have a good night. Yeah, you, you too. too. Bye. Right. Bye. All right. That was great. Yeah, um, that was amazing. We just have a couple more things to do before we say good night to everyone. And we're going to talk about the audiobook of the week. Uh, and so my audiobook of the week this week is, I'm going to pull up the thing. There we go. Some Girls Do by Jennifer. I actually don't know how to say her last name. Dugan. I would have said right. Dugan, but I don't cool. know either. <laughs> <laughs> um, narrated by Nora Hunter and Bailey Carr. Uh and this is the the little blurb from the publisher. In this YA contemporary queer romance from the author of Hot Dog Girl, an openly gay track star falls for a closeted bisexual teen beauty queen with a penchant for fixing up old cars. Oh, very cool. Yeah. This what did is you one, think? Did you like, was it good? Yeah, I really liked it. This is one when I saw the pitch, I was like, yes, this book is for me. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, and Jay said it's a beautiful cover. Yeah, it is a beautiful cover. I love it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after reading it, um, the the character that owns that car is like really touchy about that car. And I was like, and she would never <laughs> yeah. let you be on it. No, especially <laughs> wearing wearing jeans, maybe with like little rivets. <laughs> yeah. They're probably wearing shoes too, you know. No. Like <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Um and like uh, you know, there's a lot going on and there's like the issue um, and dealt a bit with the issue of like having one partner being out and one partner not being out and not feeling safe coming out. Um, so that, yeah, there's a lot going on. I really liked it. Really enjoyed it. And the narration was really good too, which is important. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, that was fun. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the viewer poll. I just need to share the uh, screen real quick. So give me one second and I'll pull that up. All right. So the question was, have you ever bought a book because of an author's social media presence? And I spe specified author, not a third party, um, you know, person. So not like a, a book talker who's not the author. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and so we have, and I will say this is, of course, skewed by the people that follow me. And so this probably is not representative, like the population at large. <laughs> but 27% um, said, yes, they've bought many books because of author social media. 58% said yes, here and there. And only about 15% said no, they hadn't bought a book because of a social, author social media. I did get a couple of replies there, though. Oh, oh yeah. Um, that were people saying they have not bought an author's book because of their well, I know, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> Which you think is just like authors misbehaving? I don't think. I don't think like anyone who's you know, a, trying genuinely to be a good person has to worry about that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, cause we always say social media doesn't sell books. Um, but it was like that conversation we were having earlier yeah. with Sienna. I don't think it sells books directly, but, but indirectly, you know, I also, I have kind of wondered over the past year if just everyone being at home more and, uh, if maybe the pandemic that has changed mm. and, you know, might be something that stays. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Leah, thank you so much for coming on today and being such thank a great you. 
guest go guest co-host. Um, do you want to tell before we say goodbye? Do you want to tell everyone about your book? Yeah, well, it's um, so it came out just about three months ago, so it's pretty new. It's my debut picture book. Um, it's about a little rabbit. I wish I had it here. I have it behind me. Um, it's about a little <laughs> rabbit who can't fall asleep. Um, and so with a little help from Mommy Rabbit, um, he turns his thoughts into dreams, uses mm -hmm. his imagination to turn his thoughts into dreams. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the illustrations are beautiful. They're, like I said, they're so calming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. And that is happy dreams, little bunny. So if you, if you like picture books or if you have a kid in your life, go check that out. Thanks. All right. Thank you. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to okay. just do a couple closing announcements and I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay. Bye. Okay. All right. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe right there so you don't miss another episode and tell your friends because that is how people find out about stuff like this. You can also subscribe via email in the description and um, the Patreon link is also in the description. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. You'll see their names at the end of the broadcast and I just value them so much and I love having them to talk to and bounce ideas off of. And um, so thank you all for being part of this community. The social media for Leah and website is an Amazon link and everything is in the description. Um, so go check out her books and her, her Twitter and Instagram and everything. Um, upcoming, we have uh, Queries, Qualms, and Quirks next week is a, uh, a middle grade contemporary author. And she has a really interesting story about how she got her book deal. It came from a tweet <laughs> of an editor asking for a specific, specific type of book. Um, and uh, she has, you know, some great insights. So I, re I recommend you check that out on Thursday. And then we're continuing the Wednesday write-ins every Wednesday at 8 p.m. until further notice. Um, so join me and Beth Carnan. But this week, we're actually going to have a special guest co-host. Kelly Garrett is going to start us off with Bess because I have a, a panel that I'm coming, coming to uh, are coming from. So I'll be a little bit late. So Kelly is going to start us out. So always happy to have Kelly on my channel. All right. I think that's everything. Jay, thank you so much. Jay said, don't forget to like the video. <laughs> Appreciate you. Um, yeah. Everyone stay safe. Wash your hands. Uh, wear a mask. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.